talk a little bit from the heart for once, okay? Like like maybe I I would have done at one of my classes. So what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just, I'm just setting things up in the background now. It is on record. So, and watch what you're saying. Um, the, the C word was nearly mentioned today. We're not allowed. So, right. Okay. I, I'm just, I'm just get, finally just getting one more thing done and we, we will get moving. And I've just got to do that. And bingo. Right. We, we are. Everything's everything's on, and I just wanted to, I just wanted to say that we we've got archaeological work going on at the moment at different localities, and hopefully you like the like the Elysica that we sent out, and we have officially started by the way, and you know we we've. You know, Lant the Lantrop Major excavation has been mentioned a couple of times. And I decided that it, it's, it's made me think a lot on where I'm at now because I, I, I've nearly built a an office as well as building a whole house. And in the next few weeks, I'll be able to sit down and do the archaeological work that I've been planning to do for the past 25 years. So I'll, ha I'll have a space that I'll have all the artifacts around, maps and plans. And in similar vein with what they're doing at the Ness of Bodga, which we'll be looking at next week, and in similar vein to what they're doing at Lantwick Major and lots of other sites, as I'm doing work, processing finds and, and, and so on, bringing stuff out of boxes, I, I, will be, I will be putting them online and I will be telling people where I'm at with with the work that I'm doing, mm. so so that, that's 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 what, that's what I'm going to be doing, it's and amazing. and it's, it's and, come round to this, you know, to be able to do this is fantastic. No, yeah. it is fantastic. But one one of the one of the things in life, and I'm sure we're we're all victims of this. We keep saying we're going to do it, right? And uh, mm. I, I've I've got box loads of stuff, and and I've said to uh, the printer i've said look we've got to we've got to get two books out in the next um year or so one of them's the one that i'm that i'm um that i've now gotten to get on top of with with the barry book with richard and there's another one that i want to get out as well so it means i've actually got the space to do this and i've got the thinking space but there is there is one there is one thing that that keeps on eking at the back of my mind about you know, I, I've got the studio in Barry, and it, it's uh, it's something that that we've we've we're trying to get the museum thing set up because I've been doing everything down here. I've, everything's been on a back burner with Barry. Um, and what's eking on the back of my mind is that there are still a few people uh, that want me to come and do live stuff, and it, it's something that I'm still churning around in my mind how that works and so on. So it's not a definite no for Chris and Lynn and a few other people, golf, but it's still something that works in my mind. And I'm actually, I'm actually in the in the place in my life that I've actually thought, right, the only way to actually do everything else in my life now is to actually have um, solid foundations. And with a house, which I don't have to pay rent for or rates, uh, with a um, with an office that I don't have to travel back and forth to. I, I can get on with stuff. So there, there's a lot coming, folks, but it's going to be probably in the next uh, month, six, seven weeks that, that you see a change. And on that note, I wanted to be quite revealing because we, we were quite revealing with lots of other things last night at the end. So I, I want to I, I want to just um, get on with the images. And I, I've lost you a sec. And I want to stop that share. Let's start sharing properly. And and oh, and these these classes on a Wednesday started off with me on a in a goat shed. And that's a fact. I remember lying down in a goat shed, telling Goff that I just chucked the goats out, and 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 we were try, trying out the technology for the first time. Strange that we've got um, an artifact from Lantwick Major to start off with, but. 
maybe what I'm going to do as I did last night was start off with a very queer image indeed. Now, that is very odd. I haven't told you what we're doing tonight either. So that's what we're going to do. And what we are going to do is I'm going to go to my notes and I'm going to say that we'll be looking at tonight. We'll be winding up the lecture on Wayland Smithy because there were one or two things I didn't tell you last week on Wayland Smithy. I want to put to bed Mice Howe because I keep mentioning Mice Howe in every other lecture. And it'll certainly be mentioned next week as well. But you'll know more about Mice Howe to understand my fascination with it. We're also going to be visiting an island tonight, two islands. One of those islands is an island that we I've never really done in any of my classes. It's the Isle of Wight. We looked at a Mesolithic site off the coast of the Isle of Wight, and no doubt we've done the English and Spanish Armada that may have involved the Isle of Wight. But for archeology, span we look at A, the only upstanding Neolithic site on the Isle of Wight, the only one. Now the Isle of Wight is south, of Wiltshire, naturally, which has lots of archaeology. And you're thinking about Wayland Smithy, up Swindon Way as well. So why is there so little on the Isle of Wight? I don't know. But I thought we're going to do that tonight. And we're also going to be looking at some, some fresh news from an island that we've already mentioned in other, in other lectures, the Isle of Arran. And it's that song that Nick Kershaw, um, uh, he did a song about the Isle of Arran um, and nobody knows what the hell it was about. So, so, so those are the four things I wanted to do tonight. And there's also something else that Goff has given me about some swords in the Middle East. So that's, that's where we're going to be at. Now, what I don't want to do tonight is repeat what we did last night in many ways, more than one. <laughs> last night, it was like there were a lot of people angry last night about how archaeological sites are reconstructed and we're not really seeing the real archaeology. We are going to do a little bit of that tonight, but we're not going to get as angry, right? But I have admittedly made a mistake when I've been telling you about Mice How. It's not an academic mistake, though. It's a, it's a mistake of not questioning the archaeology. Now, this is the inside of Mice Howe. And usually when we think about Mice Howe, this is an image from 1861, obviously not photographic, but a line drawing. And what this shows is it without a roof. That shows it without a roof, but that shows it as it may have actually looked. And, and people were thinking last night, why are you doing this, Carl? Why didn't you just stick to the narrative? It did have a roof on it. And I just said, but we look at other sites that we argue whether there were roofs on them in the Neolithic or not. And why didn't I do the same with Mice How? So what I would like to do on that vein is quickly dart over to Wayland Smithy. Now, those, you were all here last week, so Wayland Smithy is near Uffington Horse. So we've got to get away from this image, which is Mice Howe. And what we need to do, we need to go back to Wayland Smithy. And the reason why I've been reinventing, reinventing the wheel in a couple of lectures recently and giving you more information is because sometimes that's the best way of things sinking in. And Goff um, offered us an example of that. We may have mentioned the, the excavation at Lantwick Major last week, but for some reason, Goff was out the room and or may not have taken it in. 
and Goff's come back and said there's an excavation and said right we, we can we've had a little bit of a discussion about that that's this week and it's always good to revisit places because it it sort of helps us and just that little thing about the excavation in Lanthrop Major today I didn't know when I was when I was talking about the carved stones in the gallery at Lanthrop Major the little museum at the church at Lanthrop Major I said I was talking about different things and I said well I believe that the original Christian community in Lanthrop Major was established in the days of the Roman world. And I would be very happy to hear of Roman artifacts being excavated at the Bishop's Field at Lanthrop Major. Mm. And um, I do believe it's a Bishop's Field. Um, so so I, I, I'm not exactly. But anyway, Ooh, I, 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 um... said, I, I said, I said, uh, it doesn't matter where it is, really. It's yeah. still Lanthrop Major. Right. Like, like the point is, now let's get to the point. Forget where it is. It can be on the moon, but it's in Landsberg, right? The point is, is then Richard said, yeah, actually, they have found Roman pottery on mm. the excavations. Yeah. And I thought, you know, I don't want to say how right am I, but, yeah. you know, some of these things really interlink. And we've done a nice little bit of interlinking tonight. That, so it makes archaeology relevant. Now, last week, we we said about Wayland Smithy and we said that it's been buggered around with and it's been reconstructed and so on and so on. And this is an image showing that. And so when you go to Wayland Smithy today, there's more to this 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 bit than than this. But I said that these there, those four stones, weren't when this line drawing was made in the 1800s, probably around the 1850s or thereabout, before it was excavated in, again, 1861. Why does the date 1861 keep coming up? Anyway, it comes up with uh, Mice Howe as well. Anyway, so th this site being, um, uh, being uh, yeah, there was some investigation then, but it was it was finally excavated in 1919, 1920, 1921. And, and, you know, that's when the proper excavations were taking place. But those standing stones were not there in the 1860s, right? So that means that what you're seeing is very different from what was being seen 50, 60, 70, or whatever years earlier. So unfortunately, what we've got to put up with is archaeology being contaminated mm. time and time again. So I didn't really explain last week why they decided not to excavate in the 1960s with, with Piggott, the guy who's also involved with the excavations at Sutton Hoo in 1939. And so he decided to excavate, not in that chamber, which had been excavated in 1919, why, why reinvent the wheel and stuff. So he decided to excavate in that green area there. And, and one, thing, one thing I didn't mention, uh, I didn't show you the plan of the excavation of the bones that we were talking about. And that's what we're going to do now. And the area is actually that area there where they actually found one set of human remains directly on top of a sarsen pavement. And this area here where they actually found more human remains. Well, in fact, 25 of them. And this is opposed to what they found in 1919, 1920, 1921 when they found very few sets of human remains in the chamber at the front. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, just, I just thought, well, I just wanted to show you this. So this is, this is taken from Neolithic Britain by Joshua Pollard. And it doesn't really write much about this, but it just shows you the arrangement of human remains, which I thought was relevant. 
So that that set of human remains there, post-cast, post-cast is actually that area. And that there, those there were found in front of this sort of chambered area in like a a wooden mortuary landscape. And one of the interesting things with that jumble of bones was that it was adults, children, male and female and whatever. It was a real jumble. And some of those bones, three sets of those human remains, actually had evidence and the the actual flints themselves associated with them. And those people had died fighting, which is very different than what I usually say about the Neolithic period. I usually say it's all like a, a peace fest and nobody's killing each other. Well, they might not be warring and raping and killing in, as in later periods, but there is naturally going to be conflict between groups occasionally. And that's what we see here, which, which is different from the usual narrative that I talk about. So, I just wanted to bring that is something that really didn't do last week. And it was quite a full on lecture last week with um, the work of Stuart, At Stuart Piggott and Richard Atkinson um, in the 1960s and obviously the work in uh, 1919 and 1920 and so on. And, and I, I thought I thought just sort of putting a little bit more meat on the bones and then leading into mice how was something that we needed to do and this again we've already seen that and what what i what i what i was discussing what i was discussing and last last night was that i said what i'm going to do is i'm going to leave this image for now you know what i'm talking about but I want to look at my nice little notes on mice how. And again, the reason why I, I keep mentioning mice how, as I say, in lots of the lectures, and, and it's almost as if I'm not giving you enough information each time I mention it. Well, I'm just going to give you an overview and that will put mice how to bed. So when we talk about Vanessa Brodga next week and the new excavations and the results, and I do believe that the excavations at Nessa Brodga are now closed. I think they closed in August. And so what we're going to do is that we're going to go to the image, the images that I set up last week. And there's a plan. So Mice How will be going to the Nessa Brodga next week. And it's basically a kilometre away. It's a beautiful rich landscape of the Neolithic period. Now, if I, sometimes it's good to use what I do on a Tuesday, on a Wednesday, because it's sort of, it, it sort of is a, an overview of a big discussion because the, the class does go on for two and a half hours. And one of the things that came up last night was why, why are they building lots of monuments on Orkney in stone? Is it because they're all they've got to build with is in stone? Now, I would have answered that question if it was a year ago. Yeah, that's that's right, sort of. But now I'm wrong. <laughs> because when they've been excavating the Nessa Bodga a few weeks ago, I said they found wooden planks and they found material that that is associated with the roofs and, and so on. So they did have timber on Orkney to build with and it completely changes the game. It really, really does. And so the point is is that I'm going to say it, and this is what lots of Orcadian archaeologists are saying, 
well, I'm an Orcadian archaeologist, really, because that's where I got my master's degree, but that's not the point. Um, it's probably because in Orkney they, they were more advanced and they were able to use technology to a higher degree than in other parts of Britain. You could think that that's, that's crazy, but what we then have is then we've got the Neolithic period, Bronze Age, standing stones and stuff. So when we come into the Iron Age, we get massive conical shaped buildings like the Brocks on Shetland and the Brocks on Orkney, lots of them. And some of these Brocks were 14, 15 meters tall. Now, I'm sorry to say, right, you don't need to build buildings 15 meters tall. You can, if it's for defense, if you look at Dennis Powers Castle, which still has a wall, um, which is certainly not 15 meters tall. It, most of it is, is eight, and I think there's bits that are maximum 10 or whatever. But, but you're thinking, well, you, and you're thinking, well, they just love to build in stone. Simple as that. That's, that answers the question. So th this, this site itself is, is by far one of the finest Neolithic sites in Britain. Maybe in the top 10 of Neolithic sites in the Western Hemisphere. Now, it's a chambered calm and it's approximately if we go back to the little plan there, it's approximately 500 meters from the modern day loch, which wouldn't have been there like that back then. Now, one of the, one of the things with this site is that it's got a mound and there's a platform and a ditch running around it. And this is taken from the ditch. And we're really not sure of, of the date of this site. And, um, you know, when, you, when you're given a lecture, like I did last night, and it was getting late, I basically said, well, why do we always have a roof on this? Why can't it be open to the elements? like some people believe Brock's were, but that's another story, that's the Iron Age. And, I was, I don't, and then, then it was the question, well, is there evidence of a fireplace in the middle of that building? And I said, I said actually, no. And then somebody said, yes, there is. You, you already said it in your lecture earlier on. And I thought, yeah, Carl, you've already, just, you've already told us that they know that there was a, a house underneath this, which would have had a half in it before the stone circle was built and before the chamber was built. So sometimes I doubt myself and I don't need to because I'm not gonna say I know it all, which I don't by, by far, but I, I know enough to give enough information for you to make up your own minds. Sorry, is that my- What's story? going on with these monuments? What? Is that mice how? This is all mice how, yeah. Oh, okay. There's a cross section of mice how. As as it was um, <laughs> being examined in the 1860s, actually 1861, that data came. And it's a, it's, that plan, it looks beautiful, and actually it's more like this. But then again, they didn't have, you know, the the type of restivity um, geophysics that we've got today, which sort of made that little passageway bend a little bit. But other than that, the plan's pretty good. Now, really, we know that the ditch around it was dug around four thousand seven hundred years ago. It's important to remember, however, this ditch may be centuries built after this monument. So 
the the latest possible work at my cell in the Neolithic period was 4,700 years ago. So it might actually date to 6,000 years ago, which is quite astonishing. And what this, this is, what, one, of, one of the images that, that, that I didn't show last night, and I'm really frustrated I haven't got it on my, on my list here. And one advantage with doing this online is that I can always do this. So I wanted to type in, um, I wanted to type in mice how, and I want to see if the image that I've got here, the aerial view, is actually in this. Oh, that's what I wanted. Now you can get an idea of the site. That's what I've got here. The one thing about this is, is that it didn't look like this in 1861. In fact, there was a depression in the middle of it, or was there? Now, when they excavated this site, so obviously it's been restored, it appears as a large grassy mound and can be seen from other archaeological sites including Stennis. And it said that in 1861, this was the first time it was archaeologically excavated by archaeologist James Farrer. And interestingly enough, lots of stuff is going on in 1861. The excavations at Brixham are going to take place in the 1860s and the South, another prehistoric archaeologist, uh, was it Pengeli? Um, and and the, the point is, in the 1860s seems to be a time that lots of work is being done in archaeology, whether it's done properly or not. Now, the shape then would have been different. And one of the things, one of the things to be said as we um, look at these images, and these are the images online, that's how it looked after the excavations in 1861. And they say that there was very little found in it in the way of bones and artifacts. And I've never questioned this, folks. Never questioned it. But I think I've got an answer. It had probably been excavated decades earlier and nobody kept a record of what they found. They cleared it out, basically. And guess who they blamed for clearing out this mound? The Vikings, 600 years earlier. Mm. But it could have been equally that the damage to the roof was caused by earlier excavation work that hadn't been recorded. Remember the lectures on the barrow diggers that seemed to go on for months? There were lots of people excavating and they didn't keep records either. This, this itself, it, it's, it's, it's been taken into state care. And it's actually said that it was taller than it was actually, ex than it was actually restored initially. They believe it was much taller initially. It was like a more of a, it, it, it was, if we can get the debt in there, it said that it may have actually been more like this, which is a strange shape. And what we'll do, we'll put some stones on top of it. Or it may have been open. But nobody talks about it being open. That's blasphemy. I'm just I'm just suggest giving it as an um as a um as a suggestion more than anything. And if we go to back, if we are, we're looking in there, some great illustrations. But you can actually see how what they're thinking of, because it looks quite flat there. But it may have been more conical shaped than it is rounded today. And when they, when they restored it, they tell you that they restored it. 
but when I went in there, I always thought that that was that was like a genuine restoration, but it may never have looked like that ever, right? And that's the corbelled roof. And directly on top of that is concrete. So the rounded profile is because it supports a concrete top. And so it could have been up to 11 meters tall initially. And now it's just under seven and a half meters high after the reconstruction, which for me is quite odd. If you're going to try and reconstruct anything, you should reconstruct it in the way that you think it looked, not in the way that you didn't think it looked. But I don't agree with reconstruction anyway. Sorry about that. So now one of the one of the pickle pants that we had last night, one of the points that we had last night was I made a statement and somebody was like ardently, you know, you're wrong, Carl. You've got to be wrong this time, Carl, right? And I didn't say I'm the all, I'm the know-it-all or anything. I just basically said, I gave them an opportunity to speak, which, which I've tried to do all the time. And uh, in these notes, it says that Mice How was built in the Neolithic period agreed, constructed on a platform of leveled ground agreed, and it would have had an association with lots of other sites as well. Was it actually built for the aristocracy and the rich and people who were very wealthy? Well, all of what I've just said is nonsense because there was no aristocracy. There was no elite. There was no, there, there was, you're talking about on Orkney, it was a it was like a community family based thing because there's so many tombs, right? And then I basically said I, I listened and I said, okay, right, okay, that's fair enough. So what we're going to do, right? We're going to agree with you, but I'm also going to say that there was hundreds of these type monuments on Orkney, right? So you saying so what? There was hundreds of kings, there was hundreds of leaders, right? And then it comes back to the basic element. Maybe this was actually built for a family. That makes more sense when we look at the archaeological evidence of Mid Howe and, and, and on the island of Rousey and the work of Colin Renfrew that postulates that each of the family groups on, on Rousey, because it's quite a small island, actually had a tomb. And I think we may have mentioned this last week. I'm not, I'm a little bit grey on this, but or I may have mentioned it yesterday that when we, when we look at fashions changing, it was very fashionable in the early part of the Victorian period to have the family crypt. If you were rich enough, you had the family crypt and you may have been the head of a, a mill and you had the family crypt for the mill owner, right? And then as the Victorian period goes on, Victorian planners are saying, bugger this, right? You know, we can't, everyone can't have a bloody crypt, right? Becomes fashionable, everybody, everybody, everybody has a crypt. There's not enough room in London. So what we're going to do, well, there's not enough room in York, you know? So what we're going to do, we're going to ship bodies out of, out of London and, and they can do whatever they like. And they can have a cemetery, they can do cremation or whatever. Oh yeah, it was last week in this class we discussed that. Because, because it was um, William Price um, in regards to the first cremation at Land Trisson. We mentioned that last week. It was here. So what I'm, what, what I'm trying to get at is that fashions changed. Right? Maybe each community had one of these. And then later on, it was like, oh, God, there's just too much going on. You know, Bronze Age comes along. Maybe there's aristocracy. Iron Age, there's like groups of there's too many people around so they've got to have people to organize and so on yeah but in this stage i really think of these as family affairs and that there would have been lots of these it's the same thing that it's the same type of problem that we have 
when we look at the pyramids in ancient Egypt, we see the three Giza pyramids and we say that's all there was. We start looking around Egypt and there was a hundred of these bloody pyramids, different leaders, whatever, right? And um, and it, it's almost, um, you know, it, it's it, it, it's like when when you when you think about I got somebody else wanted to join us tonight, so I'm going to come off this a minute. Um, and hang on, I'm just saying um, one second. They want to join us. Um, come online now. Um, doing later right okay i, I put that I, I, what i'm gonna do i'm gonna give uh, richard access we're gonna we'll crack on with what i was saying now um it's difficult sometimes doing these classes when when you've got people wanting to join and stuff and uh, richard if you see anyone there then add them on there you go back to where i was talking and um share they might come on, they might not. Certainly missed a class last night. Yeah, back to where we are, good. Um, so, right, back to my thing um, of thought. What? Um, yeah, go on. Put, put, you can, what you I can don't go. understand is, um, it's strange that, you know, we thought that maybe, you know, the Orcadians came from, I don't know, Scandinavia, perhaps. And uh... right, okay, okay then. Okay, right. We'll we'll we'll, do, we'll look at that now. I'll finish. I'll finish my throw of thought. So, in other words, things changed. These types of sites were abandoned, and people dealt with their dead in different ways. The the one thing that we do know about Orkney is that by about the six hundreds, the the site at um um Scandro, I think that's the right name, also on Rousey, is evidence of a site that showed pictures archaeological evidence, and suddenly we've got um we've got Viking stuff coming in. And what 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 we do believe happened on Orkney that there were that may have been some kind of disease, um, some kind of plague that wiped mm -hmm. out the population. And then, mm -hmm. then then the Norwegian the Norwegian Vikings came to Orkney. But now we're readdressing that because that some people did survive, but the population was so limited that when the Vikings got there, it basically said, oh, you know, you carry on farming. We'll just, we'll do what we need to do. And then this site comes into play. Anything else you want to say about that, Anne? Because we're going to crack on, no? No, it was only the, um, the stonework, really. Uh, it is just, it is unique, really. Because... And it, it, yeah, Scandinavia it is. would have had a lot of wood, you know. <laughs> Scandin Scandinavia was a wooden culture um, yeah. at this time, and it was a wooden culture thousands of years later when the Vikings came here. Yeah. So obviously these people had nothing to do with Scandinavia for thousands of years. But no, no. Talk talking again about this site, you know, I, 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 I chucked a lot of different things into it. And that that if you go here those two side stones there along the passageway the floor and the roof are actually standing stones that have been relayed and the archaeology tells us that this there was a standing stone circle here before it became this monument right and it's dangerous calling it a burial chamber because that central area was not a burial chamber. Now, the point is, folks, is that you've got the chambers, these little chambers either side and in front. They may have been with other examples of these, of these types of chambers on Orkney. They would have been there to put bodies, right? But the central area wouldn't have been, right? And the point I would, and those little, those three square things are actually stones that were used as blockings for those entrances. Um, but you should think of this as like a church because churches, if you, if you go to a church and there's bodies uh, buried under the ground, and I do believe Andy's joined us. And um, if you think of a church of bodies buried under the ground, you don't call a church a burial chamber in a modern day and age. So why did we call these burial chambers? They're a lot more than just that. 
anyway, this 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 this, this monument itself, it's it, it suggests, and also more archaeological work in recent years hints that this was not only built on top of a stone circle, was actually built on top of a Neolithic house. Which again, I told you this is quite odd. Uh, that you know we, we've got this site where there's a house, stone circle, chambered site, or whatever this is. And then they dig a ditch around it. It's very odd all that going on. Now, it's and it's and the and we know about the stone circle because of these four big odd shaped stones that create the passageway into this big sort of chamber ahead from the outside. And that's Andy. So this. An excavation outside the chamber in 1996 led to the discovery of, of a socket hole on a, on behind the mound. And that socket hole housed one of the stones for the original stone circle at Mice Howe. One of the things that I say in archaeology, and I keep repeating this every single week, that, that archaeological sites are never to be seen as they are today. So if you say go go and look at Windsor Castle, it's completely different from what Windsor Castle would have been in the 1100s. You look at Cardiff Castle, that's completely different from when it was a Roman fort. Things change, things alter. And I say this time and time again. You get a, you get a, you get a shop that occupies what was once a church and then the shop is sold and it becomes a mosque and and people look at it being a mosque and you say oh this is a mosque the muslims obviously come here and built this mosque in 1853 and they didn't the people who built the building first built the church right so oh and you uh, and, I, and there, there's the um where the department store was in Cardiff, they've actually revealed the church again. And uh, was it was that Dan, um, um, David Morgan's, wasn't it, I think? And, and, and you're thinking, well, you've got Howells, a church. I think it was. Howells, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, it was Howells. So Howells was built on the site of a church, and mm. they kept the church, right? And the mm. church is what you can see today. They, the, the facade of the church, they've revealed it again. Amazing, oh. amazing that. Have you seen I, I, it? I, I haven't seen it, but I've seen photographs of it. I've got to get. I've got to get there and see it. I've got yeah. to get there. I'll tell you what, what I'm, what I'm going to do. I'll pick up. Um, I'll pick up Richard one day, and we'll go on the piss, and we'll go and see it. Um, so, and I'll bring bring you Anne, and we'll we'll buy some sherbet for golf as well. <laughs> so, interestingly enough, we, we we've got a site of great diversity and great change within the ring. They're in circles. This wonderful monument. And Andy, who's joined us tonight, wanted to hear a little bit about the discovery on the Isle of Arran. And we've got that at the end of the lecture. So I, I thought I'd drag him in on that. But we've also got something else, Andy, that I've, I've mentioned to the others. Oh, let me in. Is, is, have you let him in, Richard? Richard? No one coming up on the screen. Oh, no. then I'll see if he comes up. And... Mm -hmm. I've let him in. I, I don't know what's happened. We've let him in now. Right, he's there. Good. Is he Scottish? No, it's Andy Pringle. <laughs> You've spoken to Andy Pringle, Anne? No, I don't know. He's he's, he's a Chris. He, he, he uh he's 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 part of the the Pringle Crisps um family. <laughs> so. <laughs> Again, think, thinking about this monument of Mice Howe and trying to again put it into the context. Oh, Pringle. Of, and shut up. <laughs> um, and uh, I've got, I got to get back with it. So they, they dug a ditch around it, which is quite unusual, after it was used as a chambered monument, which is very, very strange. 
And there's something rather interesting with this. All right, so what we're going to do, we're going to go back to that image on Google uh, that we had a few moments ago. And there's a point to be made. Oh, hang on, let, let's go to the image that we had. I have to have that one, hang on a minute. Oh, there we go. I'm loving that, I'm loving that, I'm loving, loving it lots. So again, you know, if, if, I, if, I, if I draw how they think it looked, right? This, this sort of, um, this conical, uh, um, it was a conical shape poking up into the sky, you know? Uh, you know, it, it was a conical, right? You know, bit of conical, whatever. But anyway, moving that aside, and and stop the annotation, right? Um, there's some suggestion that if we go with the chronology of the site, sometime maybe, I don't know, five, five, six, six thousand years ago, this site was initially used, and there was a house there, right? Very similar to the maybe, maybe there wouldn't be, there wouldn't have just been one house. One thing that we know about Orcadian living, right, is that they built all their houses together because it's like a mutual, not a mutual protection. It's like a mutual heat thing and sort of, you know, everything sort of in one area. That's how they lived. You know, this is how they had sanitation. This is the, they had their flushing toilets. This is how they had warmth and all the rest of it. Right? So it wasn't just likely one house. It was likely a number of houses. Stone circle built, chamber built, earthen mound placed on top of it. And then they put a ditch around it. Now, I'm not going to question what my notes tell me because I'm going to use this, right? And it says the ditch was placed around it and maybe filled in with water. So we can trace that by, by the fact that they must have, would have used some kind of clay or some something in there um, because there were clays available. So there'd be clay in the ditch if it held water because the, the, the sandstone had just drained away. So it would need to have been lined. They would have filled it with water, right? This would have had the effect of further isolating the world of the living from that of the dead, right? But I've got a problem with that. And one thing, one thing, and I've got my, my PhD thing working again in my head, right? Um, that's for another day, right? Um, but one thing that we've been talking about on a Tuesday, and Andy knows about this, is that looking at archaeology from um, the point of view of, of, of space, right? Um, spatial analysis, right? And also putting that in with what Anne's done with me and Richard's done with me, Tim Ingold's following the line. Um, you don't need to fill that in water. You don't need to fill that in with water for it to be a barrier. The, the, the actual... The, the actual notion that there's that there's a ditch around it is enough to be a barrier. It doesn't need to. It doesn't need to be deep. Mm. It doesn't need to have tall sides. It just needs to be there, right? It just needs to be intimidating, right? It's like one of the things. It one of the things in archaeology, right? We always think like our modern screwed up minds and and wars that we faced. We've we've studied castles and we've studied ditches and we've studied wars and we looked at mangonels and cannons and so on and so on. You a barrier doesn't need to be as physical and emboldened as we think. It can just be a ditch. The the bank around it, the dike around it, in Orkney they call walls or things that are raised um, dikes. In the south we call them depressions in the ground. That's another confusing thing, but that's there. But a ditch can just say it's a ditch. It's a ditch for a reason. We don't go beyond the ditch. You don't need to fill it in with water for it to be a barrier. So I think that's a nice thought that the ditch was placed there. Doesn't need to have water. It can just be the, the sense of not being able to go beyond it. Do you know what? I've, I've looking at, that study that I've mentioned, access analysis, spatial analysis, and so on, and how that all works. You can have, you can go in a house, um, and there can be a door open 
but for some reason you don't go through it, right? You can avoid crossing over the road because you never want to cross over that bit of the road. Um, some people don't cross over the zebra crossing because they never want to cross over a zebra crossing. They will cross the road where there's not a zebra crossing, even though the zebra crossing's there. They did exactly the same in the past. And there's no doubt about it in my mind. Uh, anyway, so we one of, the, one of the very odd things with Mice How is getting into it. You've got to base, you've got to go on your hands and knees, right? You've got to, you've got to crawl into there, right? And it's very odd indeed. Very, very odd indeed. You've actually got to crawl into it. There you go. You've gone, the, the image there on the right, you've gone down the, the passageway. You can see the stone that lined it, one of the standing stones on the left, right? There's one for the roof, one for the floor, one on the right. You've crawled on your hands and knees, right, to get in there, right? That's that's odd. That is really odd, right? But and it makes it makes the monument very con complex in its entirety. So again, let's go back to my images. So going into here, crawling along down that passageway there <laughs> into this open space. The complexity of the chamber's architecture and the grandness of its scale has led to the idea that Meishau was built to demonstrate the power of a social elite within the prehistoric social systems of the time, except there was loads of these, loads of them. This is one that survived to a very fine degree. And it's another bloody frustrating thing with archaeology. It's we pick up a jigsaw piece of a hundred piece jigsaw and we say this is the most important piece of the friggin jigsaw, right? And it tells us everything about the bloody jigsaw, but it's a blue piece. Uh, it, it, that blue piece was actually part of a flower. So what we do, we, we look at that blue piece and we say that the bloody jigsaw is about a, a, a seascape, right? But it was actually that blue piece actually shows you a piece of a flower. Right. So we completely misinterpreted it. Right. And in archaeology, what we do, we we look at bits of evidence and we 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 plane off everything else and we say that the past was like this. We look at Otzi, the Iceman, and we say, oh, they were butchering people in the Alps. They were killing people on a regular basis because Otzi, the Iceman, got a bloody arrowhead in his in his um, um, in his rib cage. Right. And but that's only one person. Everybody else might have been really friendly. It's just bloody they didn't like Otzi the Iceman. Right. And it's just like it's it's like saying, well, let, let's just get a little bit political. Right. Every conservative is an evil, horrible person. Well, that might be one conservative, but the rest are really nice people. Um, so unfortunately, in history, we, we obsess on small survivors of the past and we must stop that because when we stop that we open our mind and then we go back to the excavation at Lantwit Major because what they're doing at Lantwit Major they're excavating a field bloody boundary but that field boundary tells us as much about the rest of the landscape as excavating a bloody building yeah to understand this monument when we, when we think about the raison d'etre of this monument, let's go to the pyramids. The pyramids, when we were taught about the pyramids in school, were built with slave labor. 20, 30 years later, we find villages of the people who served the Pharaoh for a year. And, we've got, and, and there's writings, there's graffiti to say, I'm here to serve the Pharaoh for a year. I'm going to bugger off to my family, right? So it changes the whole raison d'etre of building these pyramids people did it for the love of the pharaoh not because they were chastised and enslaved right and what we've got to do is is really open the senses and understand the archaeology for what it is and for it what it needs to be and actually Anne, right 
getting to the stage that I can actually sit down and really um, have an absorb the work that I've done over the uh, of three decades uh, will be will be a life's work coming to a conclusion. Mm. Yeah. But that's because I've been there and done that. And you made the statement at the beginning. You said in two thousand and seven, um, I made I I made the classes up as I went along. Yeah, I I I had I had taken a book and I said we're going to do that today and we're going to discuss this and we're going to discuss this and we're going to discuss this. That's what we did. Like we did slots and stuff. We did slots and stuff. And then it really surprised me that people said, "Oh God, I bloody learned something today. That was the best class I've ever been to." And I'm thinking, right. Um, yeah, but you know, um, that's based on a few years knowledge. What would people be saying now mm. after, after, uh, some people have been in my classes for 16 years and he's been in my classes for, um, 11 years, Andy. So, you know, it, and, and I've known Richard, um, since the beginning of the 1990s. So all this stuff builds and everything changes and this is with archaeology as well things change things alter things uh, things alter yeah. the complexity of our analysis but it makes the analysis more simple because you know more mm. Mm. yeah uh, and I mean, it's, it, a lot of it was in the olden days was just that you were you, you know you, it was a way of finding a a style of teaching yes that, that was you know slightly different to what you do now because you do a lot more research you've done a lot more research now I think and there's a lot there's a lot more in my head and, and yeah. the, th the thing is that this is this this is one of this is one of the things that um it was mentioned last night they said oh we'd love to have an excursion you know we'd love to go on an excursion but we don't do them anymore and and you know, it's like I've had another. I've had one of the people from Lancet Major saying, "Oh, you know, please, please come back and do the live classes." And I'm thinking, well, um, mm -hmm. the reason the reason why these classes are the way they are now is because we did them live, and we made all the mistakes. We we yeah. we made all the screw ups, right? Um, and then we get here. So, how much more power could be given um, to understanding history? An archaeology if that could be done more but that's something for the future let's talk more about this monument estimates for the labor required to build mice how have been placed at 100 thousand man hours mm. now that's considerable mm. but that isn't in a week that could have been building this monument over generations mm over many decades, over hundreds of years, nobody can really suggest that any of these monuments were built in a moment. No. Yeah, in, in the modern day and age, right, we, we, we build a house, right, and we complete it, right? And it's got to be done because we've got a plot of land and we've got to build a house because I've got to get my money back. Right. Mm. I've got to sell it on. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking generally. Right. Um, back then, they they didn't have a society which was materialistic like today. They could take their time over things. And, and their time was more important than than it is to us today. Sitting down watching EastEnders is not really using your time productively. It might be a good soap opera. Or you might watch Casualty and you might see me in it. But the, the fact the fact of the matter is, um, it, it's their time was a lot more valuable then. And using it to build this over a long period of time, like Stonehenge, mm -hmm. like the like like the Ness of Brodka that we'll see next week, like the monuments on Aaron that we're going to mention at the end. Um, you know, their time was 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 very, very different. Society, society slowly shifted um, from, from basically based on smallness to familyness, to family community, to family as a whole, to the latest changes after this monument was sealed. One of the, one of the things that we mentioned last week was about 
this let, let, let's just show you the image right because last week was meant to be a comparison between mice how and waylon smithy sorry to show us at the uh, hawkwind concert oh god where, where's the image i want to show you oh my god i'm showing you all my images on you um right there we go right there um last week we said that when this it was proposed that in the bronze age this was sealed for whatever reasons it wasn't sealed in the neolithic period it was sealed in a bronze age because people's understanding and attention and focus on Wayland Smithy had completely changed. And maybe exactly the same thing happened with our wonderful monument at Mice Howe. Sometime in the Neolithic period, they thought, right, we'll just build it, we'll build a ditch around it, and thou shall not go beyond that ditch. That's it. That's what you do. Do you know when we, when I, I I it always amazes me. You know, there, there's like a murder scene or, or or something's happened, and the police put this um, tape up saying, "Please don't cross this line," and the, and the tape is just blue on white tape, but nobody goes beyond it. Anyone could go beyond it, but nobody does. You don't touch it. So we, we've got we've got sort of echoes of the past in what we do today, our our ritualistic behaviour. Now, one, one, thing, one thing I wanted to go back to is, is that one thing I wanted to go back to is that image that we, we had at the beginning at Mice How. I, I've, got to, I've got to fess up and we've got to, got to be a different way of seeing this and loads of images of me. Now, that there, 1861, that there is a, as someone's reconstruction of Mice How, right? Now, one of the things that is obvious is if you look on the top of those plinths, um, they're flat, right? Obviously, this is at an angle they're flat right in the reconstruction they've actually taken it all the way to the roof they filled this in right but there when they dug it out in 1861 it's flat right now when we when we look at other buildings like brocks there's something like called a scarcement scarcement layer in there and what a scarcement layer is you, it's to support beams to support a roof inside the broch. That's another lecture. That's the Iron Age stuff, right? Now, when we when we do that, the person who's done this reconstruction has put timbers on top of it, right? And I, why that looks like that, I don't know, right? But maybe it could have supported a timber roof instead of a stone roof, or there there could have been beams. Oh, hang on. Let's get rid of that. There could have been beams, a beam running across here, like that, like this, like that, or whatever it was, right? To create some kind of platform above, right? That's interesting because I never questioned the roof ever because I just thought it's obvious there's always been a roof on it. But when they found it, there was no roof on it. They said that the roof had collapsed. Right now, there's two points with this still. During the excavate, during the 1861 excavations, the Mice Howe entrance was inaccessible. So they accessed from a shaft above. Now, did they make things worse and distort how we look at the site? by accessing it from the top, causing collapse and damage, causing what the real roof was like to completely disintegrate, whether there was a roof there on or not. It's said, it's said 
that forget about what I said at the beginning, that maybe somebody had ex dug in here in 1812 and took all the artifacts out and that's why there's a hole in the roof, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we do know that in the um, Orc Orcadian saga, of the late 1100s, I, I usually think it's the 1200s, but anyway, um, the Orcadian sagas actually tell us that this existed. They tell us that mine, mice how existed. It was known as Orkhagur. Orkhagur. Uh, Orkhagur is mentioned by name in the Orcadian sagas as a place that the Vikings had actually visited. And we know that the Vikings were there, not just due to the saga, because on those stones, there is actually graffiti. It said that the Vikings gained access from the roof, but the Vikings could have equally have gone down the passageway. Now, all that said, really causing a lot of confusion in, in your mind, but I'm hopefully helping you understand this site a little bit. I'm going to tell you a little bit of a danger with archaeology and one of those reconstruction dangers without getting too obsessed like we did last night. So there we go. Stop that. Again, when, when you do these lectures, um, I don't always update stuff. So from the previous night, night's lecture, well, I could have put in um, Stenas. Oh, hang on. Now, the ring of Stenas is basically um, less than a mile away, right? Stenas stone. And hang on. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Something I need to show you. Um, it's not the right one. Hang on. If, we, if you type in Stennis and you type in Mice How, I want to, I've got to show you this. Basically, those two stones are aligned with Mice How. It's nice, isn't it? But if you've heard my lecture on, on, on the ring of Stennis, you will know that some of these stones have been moved and you'll mm. know that that stone on the ground was part of a bigger stone because it's aligned today doesn't mean to say it's always been like that mm. and that is a shame that history again is being distorted from a modern angle and fin finally about my how before we go on to the other two fragments of history tonight as Neil Oliver says, we are time travelers. Um, let's go back to that. And, and just think, and not that, we go back to all these bloody things again. Um, and there's some of the carving there. And they say that if this is actually aligned with midwinter solstice, and the the um, the light flows through there, and it shines in the back of the chamber, or actually into um, one of the sub chambers beyond. And in that sketch, you can see some of the rooms. So what we're going to do now? That's 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 our bit for the uh, mice how today. So what we're going to do? We're going to go to. The other unusual place that I wanted to do today, the place that we never ever visit, which is actually the Isle of Wight. Yes, and we don't have much to say about this site on the Isle of Wight, but what we're going to do is we're going to go to uh, the Isle of Wight and we're going to go to something known as Longstone. I, I am absolutely fabergasted that there's no... There's no megalithic other stone standing on the Isle of Wight other than this one. That's all there is. You would think near, near, nearer Brittany and all the monuments in Brittany and so on, there'd be loads of stuff on the Isle of Wight. And a bit further north, you've got bloody Stonehenge. You've got 
West Kent at Long Barrow, we've got avenues and all these bloody things. But you've got this one monument on the Isle of Wight, and that's it. And there it is. Mm. And there's another stone alongside it. Right. So you're looking at that mice how and you're thinking, ah, surely, surely. And that stone has actually been quarried. Somebody said last night, they said, oh, Carl, you're not really being fair. They, they, they're, they're, they're building out a stone on Orkney because there's loads of it. Well, you, they, that would have been quarried as well, as much as this would have been quarried on the Isle of Wight. Mm. Right. As much as there were, there were glacial stones lying around to build Stonehenge. And look at all the bloody stone. Look at all the stones at freaking Avebury. You know what I mean? So that's not really real an argument. So, so I thought I'd just look at this, the long stone, the megalithic stone, near a place known as the Mortarstone Village on the Isle of Wight. You know, when people go abroad, I, I, I sometimes jokingly say, um, when the, you know the likes of. Goff goes to Madeira. I want another Madeira cake, by the way, Goff, because the last one was gorgeous. Say, so go and have a look at a few prehistoric things. Go and have a look at this and that. But but sometimes this stuff isn't there, like it really isn't there on the Isle of Wight. Now, there's not much there's not much I can say about this monument, but I really wanted to do it. I really want to do something odd, different. And so the longstone consists of two pieces of local um, green sand sandstone and this itself is this is it was quarried in a vein a hundred meters away right but they decided to put it here which was slightly higher up and the larger stone stands at just under four meters in height and the smaller one lies on its side they're near a small wooded area and this itself, the local place, Mottis Stone, takes its name from this stone. Now, you know, when we talk about reconstruction, right? They even screwed this up because that stone that those young children are sitting on, to give you an idea of scale, was moved. <laughs> moved. They got two standing, they got two stones on the Isle of Wight, and the one lying flat has been moved. So it was moved in ninth, it was moved in 1856. It was said to be a little further south, and it had been moved by the landowner, the Lord Dillon. And not only did the Lord Dillon move the stone, he turned it over. Um, so it's lying the other way round from where it was in 1856 and it's been moved to here because they thought there might be holes or cup and ring marks in it, but there wasn't. Oh. Its present position has led to fanciful tales of it being a sacrificial altar stone. Oh. And so, in common with many other megalithic monuments, modern pagan meetings and rituals are associated with it. And you're thinking... Oh, Isle of Wight. Isle of Wight. Yeah, <laughs> Isle of Wight Festival, you can imagine. Yeah. And, but you're thinking that that's that's not even possible, that it could have been an altar stone and it's been moved. And why? Um, and the problem is, when you're reconstructing a character of the past, by using a modern perception of the past, which is completely wrong, where's the reality? You know, um, well, it might be I, a sacred site, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. anyway, in October 2007, the larger stone was vandalized by unknown persons who painted the white outlines of a Christian cross onto oh. the side facing, um. The, the one on the ground mm. um there is some there is two other things with this we know we've got an idea of the date of this stone now the stone is associated with a mound nearby that's 20 odd meters long and that was excavated in september 1956 100 years after this stone had been moved 
by a guy by the name of Mr. Hawks, appeared to confirm that there was a long barrow. So we've got a long barrow there nearby. So we've got two monuments. There's probably other long barrows on the island and so on. So it said that this these two stones may have been associated with the long barrow. And if these are associated with the long barrow, The, the, the pottery that they found associated with the long barrow was Neolithic pottery. Mm -hmm. So this is a Neolithic monument, mm -hmm. a megalithic monument, mm -hmm. and one of the only one of the oldest surviving pieces of archaeology on the Isle of Wight. I, except when you when you go to a little bit further north off the coast, you got that megalithic site, which dates to over 8,000 years ago, right? And it's a timber megalithic site, the one with the platform, if you remember it. And they, they found evidence of early agriculture there, which, which basically said, well, hey, the Neolithic has arrived in Britain. Mm. So, and I, I don't know why that is. I don't know why, you know, but we've got a lot, the, the Isle of Wight is teeming with Roman sites um, and everything, but... <laughs> And loads of medieval sites and, and so on. But when it comes to the likes of earlier sites, mm. we really struggle. And, and and I can't I can't really give you an assimilated answer. Um be underwater, you know, Carl. What's that? They could be underwater. They've got a lot of erosion on that south coast. Yeah. yeah and, yes. And and, and, and this there is, is the thing. Some uh, this thing that, that as, as, yeah, no, I just said there was Mesolithic stuff on, on the North Coast. Andy's got a point that maybe, at, well, this is the point, what we do see when we're looking at um, Australian archaeology, they're now starting to work out that people got to Australia 100,000 years ago or whatever. We remember doing a lecture, but all that archaeology is along the coast under the water, right? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe people in the, in the earlier periods stayed to the coast because the Isle of Wight was heavily wooded and it made more practical sense to be along the coast or back then in the megalithic period, mesolithic period, uh, the landscape, there would have been a little trickle, right? And that's nearer, the, you're nearer the water mm -hmm. and those sites would be under the water, as mm -hmm. Andy said, and as mm -hmm. we've in intimated, and the site is called Boulder Cliff. That's the site which is under the water, that mesolithic site. So that explains some things that people stayed to um, the lower areas um, and below the cliff lines, which is now submerged by water, than actually inland where this site is found. So the last um, one thing, one thing I, I would like to uh, do now is is we're going to look go to Aaron, and uh, this was something that Aaron uh, Andy said. Have you heard about that that excavation on Aaron? Have you heard about what's been found on Aaron? And I said, yeah, bloody hell, yeah. Uh, we we did that last night, so this is what this is what we're going to do tonight. Um, so, unfortunately, the damnable nature of the new, this new excavation was that um, I couldn't really find any other images or anything. But one thing that we've done is that site. We've already done that um, circle mm -hmm. and, and the stones at Macre, right? And that's looking over the area and the landscape. So that's which is Macre and the stone circles. And nearby is this Neolithic Cursus monument, which is amazing, found on the Isle of Arran. This is one of the most furthest north Cursus monuments in the whole of Britain. There are other Cursus monuments in Scotland, right? But this is one of the furthest north ones. So we're just going to go with the notes that we've got and see if we can add a, a few things to this. But before we do that, I said there was going to there, there was going to be a little bit more in this tonight, um, a little bit of news. This is nothing to do with the Isle of Arran. Um, uh, this, this was this was something that has been ver released very very recently. I'll just chuck it out. What they're actually starting to find now, all the evidence is when they're looking at the Neolithic period in Africa, is that people are equally coming from Europe and Asia to Africa, as much as people are going from Africa into Asia yeah. and Europe. 
there's a massive interchange. There's a ma massive um, exchange of humanity going back and forth. It's not one way anymore. No. So in other words, when people say, oh, it's out of Africa, or people are coming out of Africa into Europe, people are going from Europe into Africa. People are coming from Asia into Africa. People are coming from Europe into um, Asia. And this is what they're seeing, this, 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 trans, this trans humanization um, of the movement, movements of people. And this is, this is very much what this new story, this very revealing story is, um, when we start to look at how things are evolving in the study of the prehistoric world. And, and what you can say, you can say that's a model for anywhere. Because I, I used to say, and I used to brag that, you know, Britain, um, the first civilizations in Britain are actually coming from the north. And look how advanced we are in Orkney and, and the Hebridean Islands. And look at this and look at that. And you start to think, well, equally, people are moving back and forth anyway. Um, but we can't have one rule fits anymore. We really, really can't. So let's get to Aaron. Archaeologists uncover um, the outline of a Neolithic Cursus monument on the Isle of Aaron. In fact, they excavate 1% of it. But due to um, LIDAR and other surveying techniques, we've got a good plan of it. And we actually saw the, the LIDAR imagery last night. And maybe what I might do is, as we did last night, we went to Google. And what we did, we typed in Aaron. And we typed in the Cursus Monument. And hopefully, um, I, I, I do believe that that's one of the excavations at that monument. You can see the curve in it. You can see the camber there in that image. Um, and hopefully, if we look at some images, and there it is. That's what I wanted. And you can see the outline there, this sausage. Um, and they're saying that this monument is in fact 1.1 kilometers long it's one of the biggest archaeological monuments within mm. the hebridean islands per length per landscape and damn us all that's the point if these monuments are going over large tracts of the landscape the cursus monuments and the avenues some of them are going 10 kilometers up and down hills, up into valleys, up here, right? If you've got a territorial landscape in the Neolithic, I've got to ask permission from Joe, Dave, Fred, Claire, Edward, Peter. Therefore, if you're able to build these monuments, nobody owns and controls a landscape. Can you imagine this? We're building our bloody Cursus monument across your territory. Oh, that person dies and you're not going to be able to do it and so on. So that's more proof of what I've been saying. It's a rolling world. It's an open world where possessions and materialism, frankly, really doesn't exist. This dates, we believe, to about 4,000 years ago. And interestingly enough, these types of things are throughout the Neolithic period. They're all over the bloody place because we want to build these things, along with bank barrows and other things that, that go bump in the night. So below the rolling heath on the Isle of Arran, remember the Nick Kershaw song, put that in there again, overlooked by harriers and the occasional peregrine, a monument to ancient ceremony, has been partially un uncovered, only 1% of it. Archaeologists working in August, uh, working alongside local volunteers, began their excavation, a drumadoon of what is almost certainly the only complete Neolithic Cursus monument found in Britain. Um, yeah, well, we talk about you know, the avenue, um, and, and we talk about the, 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 the avenues, the Stone Avenue, leading to the likes of um, um, uh, Avery, and we talk about the, the great curses um, at Stonehenge, 
And basically, um, avenues are slightly different from Cursus monuments, but they are sort of linear sort of landscapes that keep going. Um, Cursus monuments are basically sausage shaped. They, they're they're um, a continuous bank with a ditch um, that is in two linear lines. The curves at both the terminals goes back on itself. Um, and it's a continuous thing that rolls across the landscape. And we've done classes on these, as you know. So these vast rectangular, um, rectangular, um, parallel lined landscapes, we don't really know what they're used for, whether they're ceremonial, ceremonial landscapes, gatherings, processions, whether they're landscapes of those that are in the afterlife, they're playgrounds for those that actually um, are no longer with us. Some of these, some of these, some of these wonderful Cursus monuments, and the Romans called them Cursus monuments because they sort of were like um, the Circus Maximus in Rome. Um, you know, they they, they seemed like yeah. big racetracks. Um, mm -hmm. So ranging in size, roughly between two hundred meters. There's some two hundred meters on mainland Scotland. I know those, um, and you've got the ten kilometer ones further down south. Um, some you, you, some posts were associated with these. The, these are these are constructional landscapes, one point one kilometer long. This one, and it's associated with Macrae Moor that we've already done. And if we go to that, there we go, Macrae Moor, and isn't it Macrae? The, wonder, the wonderful water, isn't it Macrae? Oh yeah, Macrae. That'll do, Macrae. Yeah, sorry, you are right, Macrae. It's better than Don um, Macri. And this, when you think about this, this world that's been erected there, there's standing stones, there's all sorts of things. And it's very likely that the Macri Moor um, eventually, because there, there were climate changes, uh, the landscape would have undoubtedly been abandoned. And this Cursus monument itself, therefore, was abandoned. And nobody ever damaged it or affected it. Um, there's a crazy amount of labor involved in the building this monument. And they've only excavated 1% of the Cursus Bank. Um, and it's said, obviously, you could think about the, the sticks, uh, using sticks and bone tools and um, scapulas from, from uh, cattle and so on to dig it. And maybe edged shovels with stone or flint. But again, this is this is great to actually link it with the the Macri landscape that you can actually see. And as I said, we did this and we looked at the stone stir circles there. The archaeologists believe that the cursus was either constructed over decades by small local groups or maybe one family group. Um, and but one one interesting thing that the archaeologist says about this monument, which I completely agree with, is that there must have been a phenomenal, 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 I said it, phenomenal, got it there, phenomenal social glue, blinding, binding people uh, to realize what was likely the vision of, uh, of um, their feelings of the time. To, to do this, you're bonding, uh, mm -hmm. you're creating, you're assessing, you're making good. Um, and the remains of the Cursus are um, unusually well preserved thanks to the upland location. Away from the, the more recent intensive farming, it's a peat bog landscape, the, the laser images that we've already seen. And uh, one of the archaeologists from Glasgow University says the initial discoveries revealed a highly unusual combination of ceremonial uh, landscape. There is farming landscape nearby as well. It's also part the continuum of the Macri Moor, so um, uh, as a whole part of the drum, the, um, Drumadoon landscape, um, an extensive world, an extensive look at a, a time sign, a time capsule of the past. Mm. Having that number of people looking and thinking about the monument for the first time today in, in potentially several thousand years, created a real energy. They reconnected with this Cursus monument and the rest of the landscape that we're seeing. Mm. And 
there's one thing that I that I took a bit further last night. But we'll move it a little bit further. And then we'll look at the last piece tonight, which is a Roman piece tonight. I, I completely concur with the archaeologist thoughts from Glasgow University in reading out this statement. There's a phrase about the theatre of excavation and bringing people together to congregate on the hillside, working through questions together in a strange way as an affinity to those people making the sense of the whole of, of the world, the, the whole world around them when the cursus was first constructed. And in many ways, we do that every single week. We, we create a theater of thought and we look at images and we discuss it. We are as much actors on the stage today as actors in the past trying to understand their own landscape. And that own landscape is the landscape that we look at today. And in many ways, something quite fitting. This isn't the last thing said today, but one important thing, when you look up into the sky today, it's the same sky that they looked at that. It's mm -hmm. the same clouds that they may have been looking at. Mm -hmm. It's the same sense. If you close your mind off and you look up, they looked up at, as well. They looked at, up at the same stars as us, the same moon, the same sun. So what has happened in those thousands of years when you're still looking at the same monument that they looked at four, five, six thousand years ago? And before we actually do questions, I want to do one last thing tonight. And the one last thing tonight that I'd like to look at is hopefully um, the last slide. And these have been found in the, in the Holy Land. Four excep exceptionally preserved Roman swords. I, 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 these look like the one on the left looks like a gladius, and these look like the cavalry equivalent of the gladius, which were, which were a lot longer. So, um, what we're going to do, I don't know if that's in the article. I've got to be honest with you, I haven't actually read this article. So, um, I'm just going to try and find it here a moment. And I may have to get it back up on my device which I'm going to have to do. I don't know why I've got Samson of Doll up here still, but let's just um, type in four Roman swords, and we'll read out one of the articles. Roman swords found. Roman cuisine. Roman swords found. Here we go, got it. Bingo. Dead Seal, Dead Sea, reveals four 1,900-year-old Roman swords in a cave. And those two archaeologists, bloody hell, they look happy. Uh, the archaeologists Haga Hammer and Uria Amisha uh, with one of the swords found in the cave. They do look really happy. A cache of four excellently preserved Roman swords have been discovered by Israeli researchers in a cave overlooking the Dead Sea. Three of the 1,900-year-old weapons, whose iron blades are 60 to 65 centimeters long, were still in wooden scabbards. They were found in a near inaccessible crevice by a team photographing an ancient inscription on a stalactite. Archaeologists mm -hmm. believe the swords uh, were hidden by Judean rebels after they were seized from the Roman army as booty because mm. there, there are rebellions going on in the seven, 70s AD and there were other rebellions mm. in the 120s AD I think somewhere like that anyway mm. uh, the, the, the 70s AD was when there was the siege of Masada anyway this is a dramatic and exciting discovery touching on a specific moment in time it's said that the dry 
desert climate around the Dead Sea enabled the preservation of artifacts, Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, preservation of artifacts that would uh, not survive elsewhere in Israel, in other parts of the world, I would say. This is a unique, unique time capsule whereby fragments of scrolls, coins from the Jewish revolt, leather sandals, and now even swords in their scabbards, sharp as if they had only just been hidden away today. 50 years ago, a stalactite with an incomplete ink inscription written in ancient Hebrew script was found in a small cave high on a cliff above the Dead Sea. Archaeologist Dr. Um, Asaf Gava, Gaya, uh, which is, um, oh, that's not one of those in the photograph, um, um, uh, and a photographer went to the cave with the aim of using multispectral photography um, to decipher parts of the inscription not visible to the naked eye. Uh, while on the upper level of the cave, they found, they spotted a well-preserved Roman pillum um, mm. or javelin in a, a narrow crevice. And we'll show you that now. It's in one of the other images. Um, there is... Um, hang on. That there is the pillum, which is basically a pillum is um, the end of a large spear. And when that hits a sword, it was made, not a sword, when that hits a shield, that long piece of metal bends because it's, it's made of a soft metal. Uh, the tip isn't, but the, the rest of the shaft is. And when that hits a shield, it bends and the person carrying the shield has to throw their shield down because it's you can't take it out and throw it back because the metal's bent. Um, that that's that's what that is. And it turned out, and they found four um, scabbards. Um, three of the store, swords were still in their wooden scabbards, and it identified as a Roman spartha, a long sword. Oh well, I was right. They're cavalry swords. If that's a spartha, a Roman. Spartha is a Roman cavalry sword, while a fourth shorter weapon was identified as a ring pommel sword, which is a typical gladius or close to a gladius, the one on the left. They had well-fashioned handles made of wood or metal. Leather strips and pieces of wood and metal belonged to them uh, were also found. It looked a bit like a pile of books, but swords. Sure, we know the story from history, but to see such a find is to look history in the face. I completely agree. And finally, looking at this today, the final thing to be said today, I can just say the hiding of the swords and the pillum in the cave suggests that the weapons were taken by Judean rebels from Roman soldiers as booty or from the battlefield. I have my take on that in a moment. They were then purposely hidden for reuse, possibly during the second major Jewish revolt against the Roman Empire in Judea. That wasn't the Masada siege, because that was in the 70s AD. So they're saying this was the um, a later revolt in the 130s, um, um, 132, 135, which would have been in the reign of Emperor Hadrian, I do believe. Um, and we are just beginning the research on the cave and the weapon cache discovered in it, aiming to try to find out who owned the swords and where, uh, when and whom they, they were manufactured. I, I was thinking that maybe, maybe they were brought in on a boatload and nick and, uh, taken from a, a Roman legion that was was overrun by those in revolt, who, who were involved in the revolt. Two things to say, um, the, Jew, the Jewish rebellions caused the Jews to spread across the world. Uh, that, that's, that's one of the stories. And my take on this is, and I think Goff said, what's your take on this? So this is my, this is for you, Goff. My take on this is that it's very likely when these were recovered by these Judean rebels, they panicked. Because if they were found with any of these swords, they would have, they would have been probably put to death or, or um, instantly. So they needed to hide these not that they were going to be reused again, but they had to hide them because the people carrying these, it, it would have endangered them and it would have endangered their family. So they had to get rid of them quickly. And that's what these are. They were just discarded. They needed to be get rid of. Anything like this, anything, if you could be identified that you'd taken it from a Roman legionary, you would have been um, executed on the spot. Your family would have just probably gone into slavery or whatever. So that's my take tonight.
hopefully that's all been absolutely fab. Oh, and one last thing. That was found at Vindalander in 2017. Mm. That's, that's the state of our artifacts as compared with that mm. almost perfect. Mm. Um, so um, I just wanted, so Vindalander, very good preservation on one of the barracks there. I think that's a cavalry sword as well. Yes, it's a cavalry sword. I'm sure it is a Sparta. Um, as, as with three of these and the Gladius there and the Pilum. Well, on that note, that's me done. I'm over. And uh, let's see if there are any questions. And um, stop share. Bingo. And uh, Andy's there lying down. I think he's lost his voice. Um, and you've probably, you know, Anne, there's Richard uh, there and there's Goff. So the first one we're going to do now, we're going to do Richard. Uh, we'll do Andy and then the other two. Richard, anything you'd like to say? Uh, no, really interesting. But Good. Martin Howe is, a, you know, sort of a tricky one, you can say, with the roof and everything. The thing is, I've never questioned it. And, and maybe I should have. Maybe the problem is... The problem is, I, I, I've, I've closed up mice how in people's minds. I've said mice how X, Y, and Z, and I've, ch I chucked the thing in about mice how you know that there's Neolithic carvings there. That's nice, um, but I've never really allowed people to expand their minds, and hopefully I have now. And that's what that that's my aim of doing that today and mentioning that. Thank you, Richard. Um, Andy, go for it. Uh, hi, I've. Um... I got a couple of things, just observations. I was wondering with mice how, <clears throat> you know, you've got like um, dikes or ditches that are defensive or drainage or structural or whatever. I wonder if there was ever a, a shape or form, actually, obviously create a barrier as to whether it was um, a respectable or a, a um, sort of um, ditch, you know, creating respect for what was at the other side of it. Or maybe and, the ditch itself is respect. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And and the other um, thing was just well, well, I've seen those pictures of inside the uh, the the this tomb or cell of inside May Tau there so many times before, and it only only seeing it on the phone here, it's slightly changed the perspective on it. And I was just thinking, with corbelled roofs, you can move the next slab or whatever it is or brick up to 50% of its width. So if it was two foot wide, you can move it one foot wide to come in to create a roof perfectly safely and structurally. Oh, and these people cool. would obviously have known this because they're clever engineers. If you look at that roof, and I'm guessing those slabs are the same as a lot of the other ones, they're probably about two feet wide. Yeah. They're oh, not going they're... in a foot, are they? They're going in a few inches. If oh, they they're... wanted to build a, a stone roof, they could have they could have easily done it with what's there, even though that bit's been reconstructed in places. The bit going up to it around the pillars isn't going in that much. I think those pillars. I think you're right with the pillars. I, I think there's maybe some sort of possibly wooden st structure above that, but I, I'm not so sure it had a roof now. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry I put that little um, thing in your head, but can, can you just, can you, I thought you were actually going to say something else, right? Can I just go back to the dike thing a minute? Um, yep. Th this, um, oh, we've got to be very careful. Um, dike means wall. Um, yeah, I, I ditch think then, in, yeah. Yeah, a yeah. ditch. Let's get, let's, in, yeah. In, yeah, so, so ditches. Um, Digging a ditch is a big process, and actually, it's a very ritualistic uh, process if you dig in a ditch. And that might be the activity as well. Digging a ditch yeah. is the activity, is the meaning. Yeah. The ditch is the meaning, not the end result, right? So, okay. so looking yeah, at, so that's the respect. Yeah, okay. That's the respect. That's the respect. So, um, the other thing that you mentioned, right? And I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to the images because you you've actually you've actually dug something up which um, I I need to see now and I don't know if I've got the images on you um, I don't know if we've got enough but let's go to um, probably a different way of doing this um, right okay um, there that's the one yeah yeah can I, can I let's get one a little bit more clearer right there now that 
if you've got a cobalt roof, as yeah. you've described, yeah. the amount of weight, they said that the original roof was 11 meters tall, not the 8.7 or whatever they done in reconstruction, right? Yeah. That would put so much incredible weight on what's yeah. below. Yeah. Um, there would be there would be cracks in the wall. Where are where there, where yeah. are the cracks? Right. Quite possibly. Now, yeah. I can show you a Brock building. Right. Yeah. The lower stones in the Brock are so fractured and so um, so damaged because of the weight of the stone above. Yeah. It, it's there, right? Yeah. But the, the, from that, the stones are, are no so, show no signs of stress. No, it's very little, yeah. That's compression fracture, yeah. I mean, there's one or two there with a distant little crack, but not much. That uh, could be that could be more to do with the concrete on the roof. Uh, um, well, <laughs> do, you, do you know, Andy? You, at the end of this, at the end of these two lectures, now you, you've said something that's led on to a revelation. Um, all this stone on the roof would have created stress, and there's no sign of any stress. I'm going to yep. rest that one there. We're going to leave that one there. You, you can make up your own mind without putting too much into your mind. Let, yep. That's very good. Thank, Thank anything you. else, Andy? No, that's good. Thanks. Mm. Mm. He's gone. <laughs> Must have been something <laughs> I said. <laughs> Tell me, what, Andy, what was the island um, Claire went to? Aaron. Oh, she was on their excavation. Yeah, I don't know whether she was on that, but she she sent me the link to it a few days ago, and I only opened it yet, yet, yesterday. Oh, um, right. I'm, I'm, my computer broke down, which is why I'm on my phone, and I've got COVID, so I'm having a good week. So. Oh, I had it last week. Yeah, you're... I didn't send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, I had the week. I had the weekend off this weekend, and uh, on this, the day I got to my in-laws, I, I found I got COVID, so that was, oh, was great. So. Yeah. <clears throat> but it. It's just, uh, yeah, so I'm isolating. I'm, I'm reasonably okay, but just isolating. Yeah. So. Mine, mine just sort of disappeared on the fourth, well, third, fourth day, really, but, but yeah. I think it was coming on a lot longer. I right. think it was coming on before I took the positive test you know yeah yeah um, well four uh, days would be good because i've got to i've got to go down to dorset on friday so yeah yeah you should be all right good I'm taking, i took good lots good of lem sips so i took lem sips which i know they say is not yeah. really good for you but um it just dried it all up you know and yeah um, but I'm, I'm still croaky that's the only thing yeah. So yeah. hopefully um, Richard and yeah. hopefully Richard and Goff won't have it. Right, so we we got to crack on, <laughs> and I've got I've also got to say that I'm reminded by uh, YouTube when COVID is mentioned that all of my students uh, will be having the booster jab, and uh, they are acting responsibly um, in social isolation. Oh, right. Yes, yes. Goff, Goff, any anything uh, you'd no, like to say? No, Goff? no, no questions. A very interesting uh, lecture and. Uh, I like the little Roman bit at the end. Very, very good. Thank you very much. Mm. And, and finally, Anne, anything you'd like to say, Anne, and keep yeah, it relevant it's... to the lecture because we've uh, we've got to go. <laughs> no, thank you very much for your um, your wisdom and your uh, you know in, information. Um, yeah, thank you. And. and and also, also, um, if you haven't got anything else say, to say, Anne, I'm going to say this. I I, I, I appreciate everybody's uh, continued support uh, and I would like to say that uh, and, uh, thanks for everybody sending your contributions over on time uh, we're, we're back next week oh and one last thing I want to mention uh, hopefully you've had all your lessig pillar you should have had in the post either today or tomorrow a map a plan for the ring of broad uh, not the ring of broad uh, lecture the ness of broadger lecture next week you need it in front of you because I'll be saying, right, in room 24, they found this. In room 15, they found this, right? And if you don't, if you haven't got a plan inside, in, in front of you, you're going to get completely lost. On that note, if nobody else has got anything else to say, Andy, Anne, Richard, and Goff, say it now. Okay. Oh, I won't be around next Wednesday morning. Oh. Okay, but uh, that's a shame, oh. but we'll see you on Wednesday evening. Yeah, I'll see and, you uh, Good. Hopefully Henry and Dell will be back next week and uh, 
other than that, Andy, get well soon and and yeah. keep social isolation and hopefully we'll all see you all soon. Yeah. Bye bye. Thanks very much. Nice bye to bye. see you all Wednesday group. Bye. Bye. See, yeah, see you guys. See you next week. Uh, see you, Andy. Uh, Goff Thanks, and Goff. No, no, my pleasure. My pleasure. Glad you joined us. Good. It's my pleasure. Oh, I am. I'm actually a bit worn out now. And um, yes. So the line it's called. Okay, I'm looking in the chat box. Nothing on one, nothing on two. And nobody online. Okay, nothing in the chat box. Close. Go. So, thank you very much. Don't forget to like and subscribe, join, and please show your support down below if you thought this was a brilliant lecture. Uh, press the uh, press the pound sign. Chuck me a couple of shekels over. Oh God, I I, I could do with a bag of chips. Um. Anyway, I appreciate everybody's support. For those watching tonight, whoever you are, and whoever's watching us on feed um, playback whatever you call it. Okay, I'm going now. Take care. Night-night. Not sticky. And we're back next.